Welcome to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host, Josh Green, Senator and family physician trained, uh, work in the emergency room now on the Big Island of Hawaii. Also work with the Hawaii IPA. I'm very pleased to have a program today that's gonna focus on primary care in America and speci specifically on family medicine. We're gonna dig deep into what it means to be a family physician and we're gonna also look very carefully at what the country needs in primary care to provide a really quality healthcare system for all of our citizens. Today I'm joined by Dr. Chip Hickson, I'm going to refer to him as Chip because he's a friend uh, throughout our program, who has an extraordinary story to tell. He's now the Chair of Family Medicine and Community Health at Jabsom, so he really is an expert in this area. I did promise uh, Chip that I would um, make very clear that he's here of his own accord today, giving us his perspective on healthcare in America. So his views are his own, uh, not necessarily Jabsom's, although he does represent them uh, very, very honorably. Uh, in addition to that, Chip doesn't have any conflicts uh, to dis disclose whatsoever from uh, relationships with pharmaceutical companies or whatnot. So he really is a, uh, a good-hearted guy and a clear thinker on this topic. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce us to Dr. Chip Hickson. Chip, how are you doing? Very well, thank you, Josh. Nice to be here. Thanks for coming. So um, before we dive into the challenge of primary care in America, tell us a little bit about your background, because you came to healthcare uh, by a slightly different road than many physicians do. Tell us how you, how you became a doc. Sure, so um, I grew up in uh, Connecticut and then um, uh, actually had a career in um, international work that lasted for uh, six or seven years working in refugee camps, sort of the last chapter of the Vietnam War. Wow. And it was really through some of those experiences of being out on the Thai-Cambodian border and um, seeing some of the struggles that people had and certainly no access to things like clean water or health care uh, that I uh, found my way back around into uh, medical school. Got it. So you, were, so you were not a physician yet and you saw incredible suffering, I presume, in the refugee camps mm -hmm. and that's when you decided Mm -hmm. going to go back and become a physician. And you returned to uh, the United States and went back home to your mm -hmm. hometown? That, yeah, that's correct. So I hadn't taken science classes as an undergraduate, which is a little bit of a struggle. So I did have to go and quickly uh, um, uh, pay my dues and uh, take those uh, biochemistry courses and so on, and then uh, get into medical school. And I was able to do that in Connecticut, which uh, I was very fortunate to go to the University of Connecticut. And then you chose family practice. Right, it just really made sense to me because uh, family medicine really takes care of um, the whole life cycle. So everything from pregnant moms and uh, young babies, kids to adults and chronic disease and accidents, injuries and uh, helping the uh, elderly, even helping people die well. So the whole lifespan and uh, when you come from international work or humanitarian background, I think it really um, makes a lot of sense. And so it really did make sense to me and I pursued that avenue. It's, it's interesting that you mentioned that because uh, we've had multiple conversations on this program in this venue. Mm -hmm. uh, two weeks ago or three weeks ago, we spoke about hospice care in Hawaii and how integral that was mm -hmm. as a part of our health care system. Uh, we've spoken with people that are insurance executives and talked about what it means to get people insurance coverage. We've talked to others about health technology, but today I really want to focus on uh, what it is in our country that we need. Uh, what what our primary care uh, teams need to look like to care for all these people. We have this uh, the Act, the Affordable Care Act, passed by the Obama administration a few years back now, and I want to get into what the impact of that is on health care. But let's let's start from the beginning, so to okay. speak. Tell me a little bit about. Uh, and tell our viewers what exactly is family medicine. Okay, so um, really um, primary care was first defined maybe back in the 1920s in Great Britain and they had a movement that was really towards community health centers and that's really the first time in the literature that you hear much about primary care. And so in this um, country it developed as really as the general practitioner and um, that went along in the early part of the century and then uh, World War II mm -hmm. and uh, the United States started to develop a little bit of specialization and then lots of folks returning from World War II with the GI Bill um, that really pushed further specialization and so the uh, US system sort of diverged from the British system which was really based on a strong primary care foundation mm -hmm. and moved in a direction of more and more uh, medical specialization so you started to see uh, different types of surgeons, internal medicine, pediatrics, and a lot of the different uh, groups and the subspecialties uh, forming. Yes. Then as we got into the uh, 60s, there was really this sort of demise of generalism in medicine, and so there was an effort to revive it, and so folks came together and 
um, developed this specialty of family medicine, and it really rolled out in the early uh, 70s, and you and I really are both um, products of that uh, right. early movement. Yes. And, it, um, you know, it really came after the period of the 60s and all the t uh, sort of t tumult around the country, and right. uh, family medicine sort of rode on that a little bit and attracted, I think, a, a little bit of a sort of a change agent kind of uh, individual. Right. So family medicine was born as a specialty. So to become a family doctor, you would go through college, enter medical school, four years of medical school, graduate, right. and then go on for three additional years of uh, training, really when, where you learn to become a physician and care for uh, patients in a sort of longitudinal and contextual fashion. Okay. So programs around the country have grown. There are now over about 450 wow. all over the country, mm -hmm. uh, you know, training family physicians and, you know, lots and lots of uh, family physicians in uh, working all over the country in different settings. So what you know, what, really, what are the elements uh, sure. uh, uh, and it maybe in a definition of primary care? Yes. What really has to do with uh, being the first point of access to the healthcare system. So mm -hmm. if you have a new problem, primary care is very often that point of access. Second, it's a continuity relationship between the physician and the uh, patient. And right. so it really becomes their medical home in a sense. And we can talk about that more uh, if you like. And that's come up many times because we've talked about patient-centered medical home in some of our forums. But I think you're going to be able to shed um, some further insight on that. Mm -hmm. But okay, let's continue. Mm -hmm. So you said up until about 1950, mm -hmm. uh, everyone was a, a primary care individual or a generalist. General most, practitioner. General practitioner. Uh -huh. Then uh, the specialization movement occurred. Mm -hmm. We began to have these specialty disciplines. Mm -hmm. Then in, this, in the 60s and 70s emerged family medicine. Mm -hmm. Now it's a formal discipline. There are 450 mm -hmm. programs across the country training mm -hmm. uh, the family mm -hmm. physicians of today and tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And then what happened? Now everyone will constantly say, we don't have enough physicians in the country, we don't have enough primary care providers. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you in context yeah. of this family medicine yeah. training? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, as we talk about the way the health system is uh, uh, changing, the Affordable Care Act and all the things that are going on, uh, you know, often we hear this concept of the triple aim. Right. So the triple aim is really trying to figure out how can you deliver high quality care yes. with a good patient experience at an affordable cost. Right. And so it's balancing that, the delivering high quality care and cost. And this is really where um, you know, I think family medicine and primary care comes in because we know that if you have a uh, robust um, primary care workforce mm -hmm. and what robust means from some of the experts that have studied this is about 40 percent of your total physician workforce is in primary care. Let me, let me stop right there because this is so important. Okay, so family practice docs, family medicine, those, tra I trained in family medicine in Pennsylvania back in the 90s um, and just shortly after 2000. You did yours in uh, Connecticut and then where else? UC Davis. And then UC Davis, California for your family practice residency. Um, uh, so you say we need 40% uh, in, in a system that's going to be fitted right for our country. Um, first, what are the other primary care disciplines in your mind? Sure. So we have family medicine, and sure. who else do you count sure. as family as primary sure. care? So if you look at the uh, true definitions used by the researchers and so on, they use uh, family medicine. Yes. Uh, any remaining general practitioners, and there are just a few. Right. And a general pediatrics. Yes and general internal medicine. So these are and not individuals who then go on, they may have gone to internal medicine, but they may have subspecialized in cardiology. Those people don't count as primary that, care, typically. Th th that's right. So for the researchers and so on, they're trying to get their arms around this. Mm -hmm. They would say those would be the categories, family medicine, general internal medicine, general pediatrics. What about now, psychiatry? So, Where does that fit in for you? So uh, again, this discussion can can have many circles because many people would say OBGYNs are providing primary care to women. Mm -hmm. In many cases they are. That's wonderful. Yes. Nurse practitioners, others. Uh, behavioral health certainly has a very important role. Yes. Um, but whether they're really considered primary care, I think for the purposes of most of the folks that have done this research about where is your first access point in the healthcare system, sure. it really isn't psychiatry, it's family medicine or uh, general internal medicine or okay. general pediatrics. And just so people understand, when you go to an internal medicine residency, you complete your three years, you're board eligible, you take your board exam, board certified, and right. then you can go on for additional training in a whole array of specialties, right? Cardiology or uh, right. neurology or sure. endocrinology or, you know, many of the others. So, um, but what we're talking about would be someone who finishes that three years of internal medicine training and then 
practices as a primary care general internist. And they would remain then, by this particular definition today, as a, uh, as a primary care provider, a PCP, mm -hmm. it would be okay. Mm -hmm. so, um, so we've established that these are the people that are, you know, primary care providers in our country, and we have too few. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, here comes the big Affordable Care Act, sure, right? Sure. It's kind of the giant gorilla in the healthcare arena. And uh, meanwhile, we have too few individuals that are family medicine physicians and other uh, PCPs. What did the Affordable Care Act do, if anything, to help us with this problem? Well, um, the Affordable Care Act did a lot of different things, and we're really still learning some of what it's doing because its impacts are only now being realized, right? right. So, sure. Um, you know, we have a whole uh, transformation effort going on in this state, which I think really has its roots in the Affordable Care Act. Sure. Um, the Affordable Care Act did a great deal to uh, fund community health centers, and we know that the community health center movement is a real cornerstone of uh, some of the safety net health programs all over the country. Very, very important. Right. And so, that, you know, I think it did a whole array of things. I, I mean, much of it was a financial document, and I think we've sort of come to understand that. Right. But I think what's most important to understand is that uh, for, uh, for primary care, the uh, research that's been done um, looking at the health of populations finds that if you're in counties with this more robust primary health care system, in other words, more primary care to specialty care in terms of that ratio, right. uh, you have better outcomes, meaning fewer deaths, mm -hmm. less illness, and lower cost. And so as we talk about this triple aim and trying to figure out how to really address the issues of our healthcare system, if you can drive a system that delivers the goods, right, more quality care yes. at lower cost, that's in fact what you want to do. And so the research by uh, Barbara Starfield and others yes. really shows us that. And so that's why this is an important pathway forward. So let me ask you, I guess, a, a little bit more provocative question before our first break. Um, so Chip, uh, if you're sitting there, uh, pen in hand, in the U.S. Senate or U.S. Congress, mm -hmm. or, shouldn't be long. Now. Yes, right. So <laughs> next year, when you run in front of one of these many open seats here in Hawaii, um, had you been at the um, at the forefront of this bill, would you have written, for the purposes of health care, mm -hmm. a bill that first and foremost focused on mm -hmm. increasing uh, the number of family physicians or primary other primary care providers? Is that the first thing you would have done to take care of everybody? Yeah. And my answer is no. So the first thing I would have done is one of the things that the Affordable Care Act did do, and that is attempted to bring the 30 or 40 million uninsured folks uh, it, uh, under the tent. And uh, to me, that's very, very important. Great. And that's the access piece. Now, access to who? Right. And so there's the workforce piece. And so obviously, they go hand in hand. You can't bring 30 or 40 million people into the system without uh, physician workforce in place to take care of them. But the first thing I would have done is brought them in. Okay. We pay for them already. Yes. They we get do. care in the emergency room and other ways, and we subsidize that through payments to hospitals, other things. We can talk about another time. Yes. We're already paying for it. Much better to bring them in, let them receive care at an appropriate level of the system, which would be the primary care system. Okay. Well, I think that that's, uh, that's where we're heading uh, in the next segment of our, of our talk here today. Uh, but I think we've established some important things. First and foremost, that uh, primary care providers are essential in our society. Two, we don't have enough of them. We have only about 14%, and you'd like it to be? Well, we have actually 32%, but when you look at the new students coming out, the student interest, that hovers around 14 to 18%. So, so nationally, we have about 32%. Okay. Experts tell us we need how many? 40 to 45 percent. Okay. To and student our... interest around 14 to 18 percent. So there's our issue. Okay. So we have challenges ahead, and we'll start talking about the solutions in the next 15 minutes. Thank you for joining us here at Healthcare in Hawaii. We're going to take a brief break. I'm here with Chip Hickson, physician, family medicine expert, and he's sharing with us his position on what we need to do in America to help solve this primary care challenge that we have. Thanks for joining us. And to thank our underwriters. Hawaiian Electric Company and its affiliates Maui Electric on Maui and Hawaii Electric Light Company on Hawaii Island are deeply committed to the communities they serve. Galen Ho is a senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company. The High Tech Development Corporation, the state's leading technology agency, attached to the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. 
Castle in Cook, Hawaii, with a time-honored legacy that spans more than 160 years and revolves around its mission of investing in Hawaii, creating communities, and providing for the needs of our state. Hawaii Gas, formerly the gas company, a proponent of the liquefied natural gas initiative, helping Hawaii achieve its transition to clean energy and a better energy future. Collateral Analytics, a Hawaii-based tech company empowering the real estate industry with greater and faster access to the tools and data they need to make better informed property investment decisions. I'm Nicole Horry. Thanks so much for joining us on ThinkTech. I'm Maria Kashem. See you next time. Aloha, welcome back to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm Josh Green, your host, State Senator and Chairman of the Senate Health Committee, also a family physician who works in the emergency department on the Big Island. Today I have a special guest with me, one of my own, Dr. Chip Hickson, who actually uh, is running the, he's the chair of the Family Medicine and Community Health Department over at JAPSM, the John A. Burns School of Medicine. And today we're taking up the question of uh, what do we need in America as far as the primary health care system goes. Uh, we've recently passed the Affordable Care Act, as everyone who's watching uh, is fully aware, in the last few years. And now we have 30 million additional individuals that we expect to be covered under the big tent of health care insurance in our country. Uh, Chip, Dr. Hickson, told us that would be the first thing he would have done uh, when passing a, a large uh, piece of health care reform like the president did a few years back. But now comes the challenge. How will we take care of those people? What does it mean to take care of an additional 30 million people? And what are the health challenges in America that we have to kind of wrap our arms around? So let me turn it back to you, Chip. Uh, now that we've passed this act and people are going to get their insurance um, come hell or high water, it looks like, uh, what do we need to do as a country? You said early in our earlier segment that we have a shortage of primary care uh, physicians. We are at 32%, you said. Uh, we need to train it up to increase that number up to about 40% to cover mm -hmm. the people. What does that mean? How many, mm -hmm. how many patients mm -hmm. should a primary care physician, a family sure. physician, take sure. care of, for sure. instance? That's a good, good question. So uh, typically, a family doctor would take care of about 2,500 patients. So you know, one could do the math. In a state like Hawaii, 1.3 million, mm -hmm. 2,500 per um, a primary care physician. And you can, you know, you're going to need a little more than 500 family physicians or primary care physicians to sort of carry the day. Okay. So that's uh, one way to look at it. I think that um, if you think of 30 or 40 million people coming into the system, you've got to figure out how you're going to care for them. And so part of the Affordable Care Act was to fund community health centers. And I, I want to say that I'm strongly in, in favor of that. I think community health centers with their ability to have a lot of wraparound services provide some very, very important roles and you know, huge safety net uh, health care roles in our country, very important. But one of the things that uh, is a little bit dismaying is while there's a lot of money to build um, you know, clinics and buildings, there really isn't the same sort of infusion of uh, capital that would allow for a training initiative so that we would have the doctors and nurses and the folks to staff those clinics to really do the work. So there's still a little bit of a mismatch. And I think part of that comes from the way we fund uh, graduate medical education, the residency programs that follow medical mm -hmm. school. Right. And, allow people to um, specialize in the different areas. And that funding comes really through the Medicare program, CMS, uh, Center for Medicare Medicaid Services, and funnels to hospitals. Right. So we've created this system where we want to create a cadre of outpatient doctors with money that channels from a federal agency to hospitals. So it's very cumbersome. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we're uh, left with. And um, because of the various caps on this money and so on, it's very hard to uh, access it in a way that allows you to expand the primary care or, uh, frankly, other specialty uh, care pipeline that you might need. So this is one of the uh, dilemmas, and I think that as we look more at what's happening in Hawaii, we're going to have to figure out how we're going to address that. And, and, you, and you deserve a lot of credit because you've championed the cause for years to make sure the residency program survives for family physicians and puts those people. I, I think that someone told me once that you trained, you've already trained yeah. over 100 family physicians for the state of Hawaii. Is so, that true? Yeah, so I, I really shouldn't take credit for this, but I, I, what I would say is that our um, residency program, which is part of the Department of Family Medicine, part of the John A. Burns School of Medicine, right. um, has been in existence for 20 years. Okay. It was set up very specifically at Wahiwa General Hospital in central Oahu to be in a more rural area and to really uh, be able to address some of the disparate health needs that came from that uh, area you know, 20 years ago and to this day. And so in those 20 years, uh, this program has trained 106 
uh, family physicians, and about 75% of them remain in practice all over the state. So we're quite proud of that, and some of them are um, leading community health centers, and some of them are teaching, and some of them are um, involved in the, you know, their communities in different ways, and we have them uh, on Kauai and on the Big Island and all over. And um, so yes, so you know, we, there is a track record, and we've been able to train, and we know that if we can get young people into medical school, through medical school, and they continue and train in Hawaii, there's a very high likelihood that they'll remain in practice in Hawaii. So I think that's part of the pipeline that we want to uh, develop. And I think that um, you and I have spoken personally about uh, the benefits of this. You, you established earlier in our discussion today that uh, by having larger numbers of primary care physicians, uh, family physicians especially, we see people in communities that are healthier, we see longer, better longevity, longer lifespan, mm -hmm. and we see overall less cost because people have uh, care for their illnesses before they become catastrophic illnesses, severe heart attacks or very complicated um, diabetic uh, cases where people have sure. kidney failure sure. and so on. Sure. Um, so it seems to me that it makes sense to sure. invest sure. more money in um, training family physicians uh, up front rather than say quite so much expenditure on the back end with dialysis and major heart surgery. Why, sure. why do you sure. think it is sure. that the that um, people who make these programs in DC or wherever uh, don't see that and invest much more money up front in family practice. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that people really are starting to see it. And, um, you know, there's been a number of reports. This is the um, Council on Graduate Medical Education, or COGME. This is the um, group that's uh, uh, put together to advise Congress. Mm -hmm and the uh, Health and Human Services on graduate medical education. And in 2010, they wrote this document called Advancing Primary Care. Yes. And this is where they've put forward exactly the ideas that you've described and using some of Barbara Starfield's data about the value of primary care for population health and the ability of, uh, you know, when you have access to a primary care doctor, you may get earlier treatments as you're describing before your disease escalates. You may be able to uh, you know, stay well for longer, or, and uh, you may also have access to preventive services and screening and other things that may detect disease at, at an earlier stage. And the, the combination of these things and somehow that relationship over time uh, is able to uh, also coordinate care that people need where they may need to go off to a variety of specialists, but, but that care is uh, coordinated in one place. And somehow, um, you know, the, the mix of those effects uh, can provide better health outcomes at lower cost. And so I think th your question is why aren't people recognizing this? I think they're starting to, to recognize it and uh, certainly these reports um, that go to um, uh, the legislature um, you know, speak to these things and then some of the ideas, the policy ideas in these reports are what we're seeing coming in the Affordable Care Act. So, you know, I think it is starting to uh, starting to happen. I think the more important question maybe for us sitting here is what are we going to do in Hawaii? And, um, you know, we have a very unique uh, situation here because we live on different islands. You almost need to con uh, constitute a healthcare system on each island that makes sense for the populations there, the size of those populations, the specialty mix that you may need to, uh, um, you know, match the the, the population. And uh, so we have our own uh, sort of tricky problem. The other thing that people may not realize is that we have an older workforce than other parts of the country. And so as we look to the next, um, you know, 10 or 15 years, I would expect there's going to be this big sort of bubble of retirement and you know when that occurs we're going to have this contraction of the health workforce right at the time where our population is growing and aging and there are more demands and uh, the Affordable Care Act is bringing more people uh, in the door and so I you know I think we're, we're going to really need to plan for that. So you're saying uh, it's time to put our plans in place now because five ten years out not only are we going to see more people needing primary health care or geriatric care or, or what have you, but also we're going to see a large potential retirement of the physicians like yourself and myself. Maybe not us in specific because we're a little bit on the younger side, but... Thank uh, you. Yes, well, you, you certainly <laughs> you are. You say that again. <laughs> um, so we have to be taking action now. Uh, how much does it cost to, um, from the standpoint of the investment of those um, federal dollars to train a family physician. What, what does it cost? It's a three-year commitment. Yeah, so it's a three-year uh, commitment, and um, the uh, CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, pays about $86,000 
per resident per year yes. to the hospitals that are providing the training. And, and, and again, the hospitals incur a number of costs, and, uh, but this also provides, is a way for the Medicare program to provide some uh, services to the hospitals that are caring for many Medicare patients. So that's why the system was put together that way years ago. So these young physicians, just for people to understand, mm -hmm. you and I, when we were residents and that money from federal dollars was being invested in our training, we were taking call many nights of the week and sure. month, uh, sure. taking care of people in whatever ways we could as we were learning from our peers and our mentors to become uh, good, competent physicians to take care of everyone. And I think, uh, again, I'll point out that one of the interesting things about family medicine uh, is that you take care of individuals from the time they're born. Sometimes we even deliver babies babies uh, through their youth and adolescence into their adulthood where we provide a lot of care and then uh, into old age. So it's not uncommon uh, for you to maybe take care of a baby and do a well child check during the course of your week and also take care of someone very possibly uh, in their 90s near the end of life or God forbid even if they're passing. So is that sure. is that typical of your yeah, life? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. And maybe just a few words about the training uh, which um, may bring this into focus. and. And I think we really should thank um, Wahiawa General Hospital for supporting the program as they have for 20 years. And the 106 physician graduates really are because of the hospital's commitment uh, to it, along with the medical school and so forth. But it, yeah. I think that's important. So the, the training curriculum, the residents um, work in an outpatient clinic mm -hmm. where they have a panel of patients that they follow across the three years. Right. And they follow those patients to the different settings. So if those patients are hospitalized, at Waihua, for example, they would go and, and take care of them. Right. And if they go to the nursing home, they would follow them. Or if they need to be visited at home, etc. Or if they go and deliver babies. So the residents uh, move through all of the different settings where people would receive their care. Yeah. And the process of training involves both some intensive hospital training, ICU at Queens, for example, or labor and delivery at Capilani, mm -hmm. as well as general medicine. Uh, which we um, conduct mostly at Wahiwa General Hospital. And then, of course, a very heavy outpatient emphasis. So those are all the pieces, and those come together you know, across the three years. And then the uh, residents, when they graduate, really are uh, quite capable to um, work in a rural hospital if that's what they chose, or to have an outpatient practice, or um, you know, to go on to a fellowship if they wanted to. Right. So, okay. So let, let's just, before we take our next break, sure. uh, we're, let's come back to the, the big picture here. A person finishes their medical education, in your case, after you had um, had experiences uh, working in a refugee camp and seeing, you know, significant suffering. You come back, you finish, you finished college, you go and do your medical school, you commit yourself to primary care. Mm -hmm about $250,000 is invested uh, in the training of a family physician and then we have a 30 or 40 year uh, career of this family physician who's able to take care of a child to an elderly individual and everything in between. And that investment um, that the government makes in the training ends up being paid back because in communities there's less uh, illness, there's less disease and suffering, people live a bit longer and if we have a good complement of family physicians, the costs actually uh, come down, and that's what the studies have been showing. So that's, I think, the reason that we're emphasizing today family medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll flash back to the Affordable Care Act and once again say, yes, we've invested a lot of resources in covering people, mm -hmm. but we also need to turn our attention to making sure that there is this workforce mm -hmm. of family physicians and other primary care providers to take care of us. Mm -hmm. I think we'll um, take another break here, and when we come back, let's take a look at some of the trends and what we're going to need to see in our country if we're going to keep up with the pace of caring for everyone. Great. All right. Thank Again, you. it's great to see you. Uh, we're here at our program, Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm Josh Breen, your host. I'm very pleased to be hosting Dr. Chip Hickson, who's talking to us about family medicine and primary care in America. Thanks for being with us. Aloha. I'm Jay Fidel of ThinkTech. We have some news for you. In addition to our ThinkTech TV show and our Asia in Review show on Olelo 54, as of January 1st, we're adding Community Matters to play also two hours a week. Check out thinktechaway.com for the specific times of each of these shows. We hope you enjoy all three. Mahalo, I'm Jay Fidel. Aloha, I'm Maria Kashem of Think Tech Hawaii, and I want to tell you about our Think Tech talk shows. If you didn't know it, Think Tech streams video and audio for all of its shows live on the internet from 2 to 5 p.m. every weekday afternoon. 
and we replay them all night long on Ustream.tv. Visit ThinkTechHawaii.com for our live stream and YouTube links. Raise your awareness on ThinkTech. I'm Maria Kashem, and I'll see you there. Aloha. Welcome back to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host, Josh Green, family physician, work in the ER now, and state senator from Big Island. Today I'm, I'm hosting a program to talk about primary care in America, and specifically family medicine. And I'm joined by Dr. Chip Hickson, who's a friend and who's also the uh, chair of the Family Medicine and Community Health Program at JABSM. In our first half hour, we've had a very good opportunity to hear from Dr. Hickson speaking about what it takes to train a family physician, what the need is in society to have family physicians and primary care providers, and what some of the challenges are going forward. Uh, Chip was good enough to produce a, a visual, which I'm going to hold up here in a moment and let him describe, uh, about the needs in America as a result of uh, taking care of many more people going forward by insuring 30 more million people, what the impact could be here in Hawaii, and really what the solutions will be next in order to make sure everyone gets quality care in our, our loved state. So let me hold this uh, uh, visual up, and I'm going to let Chip unpack it for us a bit. Okay. You're good there? So, yes, you fire away. Okay. So uh, this is a graph that attempts to show what we're going to need over time. So this is time down here going out to 2030. So 2010 to 2030. And on this axis, you have uh, the number of primary care physicians that might be needed. And then it looks at three things that are driving this, the Affordable Care Act, aging, and, and population growth. So what this shows is as we come, come across here from 2010 over to 2013, the Affordable Care Act comes into play. And you begin to see this thin sliver here. So this is the uh, number of physicians that we're going to need in Hawaii to care for the increased uh, population from the Affordable Care Act. This dark blue uh, band that you see growing here is aging. So as we age, we tend to have more demands on the healthcare system. And so that's this band here, and that shows what's driven uh, by the aging population. This last big section here is actually population growth. So as we move forward, decade by decade, the uh, state of Hawaii will have more people, and so more demands on the health care system. So we have population growth, we have aging, and we have this smaller sliver here, which is the effect of the Affordable Care Act bringing more people uh, into the system with access to insurance. So. Uh, this is the number of physicians we would need, and I really don't care. Uh, the, it shows 318 from what we have back here. I don't really care about the exact number, except to understand these trends. But clearly, we're going to need hundreds of, I would say, healthcare teams to be able to do this uh, kind of lifting to address population growth, demand on healthcare from aging, and the new patients from the Affordable Care Act. So I hope that's. Uh, that's helpful to sort of bring into focus what we need. So, um, so that's okay. So that's that's very helpful to me to frame the question. So, uh, if I were to ask you, Chip, first of all, first question: mm -hmm. Can we train or get this number of um, family physicians to Hawaii to take care of our people in the next 20 years? Is that possible by just sheerly bringing those people over here? Is that going to happen? Mm -hmm. So, I, I think. What's most important to understand is that this shortage of primary care is not something that's specific to one Hawaiian island or the state of Hawaii. This is a phenomenon all over the United States. Right. So what that means is that every state is rapidly trying to retool to figure out how to get um, the primary care base that they need mm -hmm. so they can control health care costs and deliver the goods, right? right? So if we're thinking that we're going to recruit these adif additional folks, we're either going to have to have huge salaries or something that's very, very attractive because we're competing against every other state that's trying to do the same thing. Right. So I think the idea that we would be able to recruit our way out of this problem is um, probably not the correct thinking. Now what we do know, and as I mentioned earlier, is that if you go to mm -hmm. medical school and residency training mm -hmm. in Hawaii, we retain you in Hawaii 85 percent, the highest of any state in the country. So the model is there. Attract the right people into medical school, have the residency positions available for them in Hawaii right. so that they don't leave right. and never to return, and then the odds are really uh, very strong, 85% that they will remain in practice. And so I think that's the rationale to properly fund uh, you know, there's some expansion going on at the medical school. It's a great thing. Mm -hmm. We need to properly fund 
graduate medical education, even when there's not new federal money coming, this is part of what we're going to need to figure out, some kind of public-private partnership to fill that gap mm -hmm. so that hospitals will be eager to take on this business of training additional residents mm -hmm. and that will begin to um, fill that pipeline. Okay, so we train some more, mm -hmm. probably double the size. I'm mm -hmm. just saying this, I don't want to put words mm -hmm. in your mouth, double the size mm -hmm. of Wahiwa because you've had mm -hmm. the success of training over 100 people already. If we mm -hmm. If we had the resources, if we can find these resources, perhaps through partnerships with Queens and Hawaii Pacific Health right. and, sure. and some state monies, mm -hmm. uh, we've then, instead of having 100 over the course of a 20 year period, maybe the sure. next 20 years, we graduate 200 sure. family practice sure. residents. And sure. so, because uh, many of our viewers probably are taken care of by an individual that trained at, at Jabsom's program. That's right. So um, that's key. So we expand family practice, mm -hmm. but even that, it seems to me like we could still come up short with the number of uh, physicians, primary care physicians, that's, that's, family practice. So what do we do? What when I, we've, we've had some shows, some programs where we've talked about the patient-centered medical home. Uh, so people might be a little bit familiar with that. Why don't you talk to me a little bit about your vision sure. for team-based care? Sure. So, uh, uh, you know, very clearly, we're not going to doctor our way out of this problem. I, I, you know, doctors are one little corner of the healthcare system. And, um, you know, the future is about working with teams and interdisciplinary teams. So wh who's in that team? Well, the configuration may be different depending on the population you're serving, but certainly pharmacists and ambulatory pharmacists, very important. Nurse practitioners, nurses, community-based nurses, outreach workers, social workers, uh, physician assistants. There are a lot of different groups that need to be part of this sort of heavy lifting that's there to do. And if we want to have a healthcare team in place, um, you know, for for grandma or, you know, as we're aging and so on, we're going to have to begin to make those decisions now and to put, um, you know, to put the um, pipeline in place. So clearly this is work that needs to be done by teams. Mm -hmm. There's some learning to go on to maybe figure out what is the optimal team, but certainly a, a family physician working with some nurse practitioners, pharmacist, social worker, that becomes a very strong model. Right. And that really can become a patient-centered medical home. And you said you've talked about it a little bit before. Right. Um, and this is, a, a, again, a little bit of a strategy to um, bring um, IT support, electronic health records, this sort of communication between hospital and outpatient settings, specialists and um, uh, generalists and the, uh, so on, so that um, the system works a little more like a system and not just disparate parts. So, so let me ask you this um, question. So I, it, that was a very good visual mm -hmm. to see with really the impact of the aging population and just population growth is having will be our greatest challenge. Mm -hmm. So we have this great challenge in America. We're going to have to have many more mm -hmm. uh, primary care physicians. And you said earlier in our program that um, a good uh, family physician might take care of uh, 2,500 individuals. Mm -hmm. If you put a family care team together, a patient center medical home, uh, mm -hmm. let me play devil's advocate. If you have a good, competent uh, patient center medical home, should they be able to take care of significantly more patients? Is that, if I were to say, um, tomorrow, a family physician was able to add a nurse practitioner and a physician assistant, mm -hmm. have some partial support maybe from a, a pharmacist and a psychologist. Mm -hmm. Should they be able to take care of 5,000 patients? What's the, um, mm -hmm. what's the optimal mm -hmm. uh, program? Do you have a feeling for that? Sure. So um, you're actually asking a fairly difficult question because uh, you know, one family physician can take care of 2,500 patients and maybe deliver 50% of the recommended preventive services. And this isn't an insult about anybody in our healthcare system. It's just a matter of really how many hours there are in the day and the time that it takes to provide all of the recommended preventive services. So yes. if you really want to pro provide all of the services that are recommended. And you're talking about cancer screening, uh, diabetes you, control, you, you, hypertension you, you control, bet, you everything. Yes. If you want to really hit all of those benchmarks with a lot of precision mm -hmm. and you have that pool of 2,500 patients, you really need the family physician and then two nurse practitioners or a nurse practitioner or PA or some combination yes. to be able to deliver that quality of care, that sort of excellence. So let me stop you there. So. Uh, First, we're saying, because I want to really get to the, mm -hmm. to the core of this. Um, okay, so a primary care physician working really hard, family practice doc like mm -hmm. yourself, takes care of 2,500 people, but still needs help to get to 
all of the core health questions a, a population has. Um, you add that nurse practitioner and physician assistant or whatever combination seems to fit in your particular practice, then you have the capacity now to take care of all of the needs of that 2,500 individuals. What does it take to deal with the shortfall of providers? Are we going to have to um, train twice as many family physicians going forward in order to get there? Are we going to have to have many more nurse practitioners and physician assistants to team up with our one available fa uh, family physician? What's your, what's your feeling about that? So it's kind of both and, right? So we need more family physicians. We also need more of all of the other uh, health care providers that make up the team. I, I think there's, we're gonna, if we're going to work as teams, we're going to have to grow all the parts of the team. And we're also going to have to learn how to really effectively uh, work together. And I think a lot of those models are still being developed yes. and uh, tested and tried different places and, uh, you know, with some, some success. And we, we should look at best practices and try to figure out what is really going to work here. And it may be different at, at different areas of the state and with different populations. But very clearly, this cannot all be done uh, only by family doctors or only by physicians. We're going to have to work as, uh, we need to work as inter dis uh, you know, interdisciplinary teams. And I think um, it's, I'm very glad to hear that because uh, I guess maybe what we're doing here with this program, Healthcare in Hawaii, is in some ways we're verifying uh, by talking to people from very different disciplines. When I had um, Hilton Rathel on the program, who's the senior vice president at HMSA, mm -hmm. he was saying something very similar, but from a different perspective. He was saying HMSA is committing to paying practices, physicians, practices significantly more mm -hmm. if they uh, engage a team, mm -hmm. if they meet more of those milestones mm -hmm. and have more quality mm -hmm. metrics, they will get more resources, which mm -hmm. they would hope, HMSA would hope, we would invest in that extra sure. nurse practitioner or that relationship sure. with a mm -hmm. diabetes educator, what have you. So mm -hmm. what they're trying to do is move the ball that direction. Mm -hmm. But someone like you, who is advocating for expansion of the actual sure. capacity to train, and you are an educator, mm -hmm. to train more family physicians, perhaps mm -hmm. double the size of the program mm -hmm. here at Wahiwa for family practice, mm -hmm. We're trying to say, well, invest those resources in family physicians because at the end of the day, your mm -hmm. return on investment from mm -hmm. a health standpoint mm -hmm. and from an actual capital standpoint mm -hmm. is very well worth it. So now we're seeing sure. those two pieces of the puzzle. And then last sure. year, last week, we had Whitney Lim mm -hmm. on our program, mm -hmm. who is uh, who's a transplant surgeon by training, sure. but now uh, is one of the administrators and a top quality guy mm -hmm. at Queens, and he's forming the CIPN, which mm -hmm. is the Clinically Integrated Physician Network, mm -hmm. which is meant to take some resources that the hospital has mm -hmm. and uh, invest in community physicians mm -hmm. and their patient-centered mm -hmm. medical homes mm -hmm. to decrease some of the possible waste where sure. people don't have good outcomes from the hospital. Mm -hmm to reinvest that in care coordination and again in these mm -hmm. patient-centered medical home teams, these sure. healthcare teams. Once again, we're seeing a kind of a movement of resources to mm -hmm. primary care mm -hmm. in order to handle this large problem, which mm -hmm. will be the 30 million or so people that we are uh, hoping will now be covered, which mm -hmm. as we started in my very first show, which it seems to be the sure. civilized thing to do. Mm -hmm. Why don't we do this? Uh, I think that's a pretty good overview. Mm -hmm. We'll take our, our third and final break for the show and okay. then we'll come back very briefly and talk about your vision for the future and what you would like to see in the state of Hawaii for family medicine. Thank you. Great. Again, I'm Josh Green, your host at Healthcare in Hawaii, state senator, a family physician, and emergency room doc. Thanks for joining us today. Aloha. I'm Nicole Horry for Think Tech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaii Foreign Trade Zone No. 9 has brought the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. DBET, the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism, operates Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone program to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone's mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii, thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Nicole Hori. Mahalo. Aloha. Welcome back to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm Josh Green, your host, family physician, ER doc on Big Island and state senator as well for Kona. Uh, today I'm very happy to be discussing uh, the primary care challenges we have in America with Dr. Chip Hickson, who's a leader at JABSM. In fact, he runs their family practice residency program. In our first 45 minutes, Chip has very eloquently uh, described the challenges we have in America. Uh, with the Affordable Care Act, we have 30 million additional people coming uh, under insurance, but a bigger problem and bigger challenge perhaps is our aging population and our growing population. 
all of these uh, variables mean that we're going to have to have many more family physician primary care providers in our country to take good care of our families. We're going to have to have teams of care, which he described very well, with nurse practitioners and physician assistants to provide that primary care. And when we do, we get a good return on our health investment and on our economic investment for the people of our country. Uh, but these are big challenges that he's laid out, and I want to turn to Chip in our last few minutes of the program and ask what his vision, what his solution for the coming decades would be in order to achieve these goals to give quality care to everyone in America. So Chip, you are now President of the United States in charge specifically of health care. What do we do? What would be the top things you would do to make sure we have enough family physicians to care for our families? Um, thank you uh, for that small charge. Yes. So. Um, uh, let me start by saying uh, we've covered a lot of ground today, and I'm very pleased to be on the show, and thank okay. you. Um, uh, you know, I think we've talked about family medicine and primary care medicine as really bringing value to the healthcare system, and that value is delivering high-quality care, allowing access for especially new, uh, newly insured patients, and, um, and reducing cost, and that's really, really important. And many countries, Spain, Canada, and others, have instituted a broad primary care program and been able to control their health care costs and really deliver the quality um, services to patients. But it, the bottom line is this really is about the patients, and we sometimes forget that, I think, when we talk about health workforce and other things. It starts to be about which specialty, and it becomes about the patient-centered medical home and some of the different um, uh, strategies or tactics that we might use, but we forget it's really about the patients. And so I, I guess as we close today, I would just like to bring us uh, back to the patient. And, uh, you know, I can say I, I'm caring for a gentleman who suffers from terrible diabetes and he comes into the office and sees me and we try really hard to control his diabetes. And, you know, as I sit and talk to him, I learn that uh, he lives in a car. And he, we have the discussion of where he parks the car and whether it's safe and what the options are and is there tr transitional housing and all of these different things and so uh, you know everything comes into the office with the patient right all of their life circumstances and uh, so I think we have to remember that medicine can do you know one certain uh, piece of this but there are all of these other issues about really what make people well healthy or place them in harm's way and so as a society if we can begin to uh, understand those so-called so social determinants of health and yes. to build communities that really are uh, safe and sustainable and uh, have um, food security and the things that patients need so that they uh, can be be well that's really a very big part of it I think we should support uh, efforts to sort of turn the I won't call it a battleship the cruise ship uh, but a little bit which is really what the Affordable Care Act is trying to do by saying hey better to get this 30 or 40 million uninsured patients and uh, get them uh, into the system in a, in a way that um, will allow them to access you know, meaningful care at an appropriate level. So I'd say we should embrace that. In terms of Hawaii, I think that we um, really need to keep our eye on the ball. It's very true that uh, because of the aging physician population that we're going to have a shortfall. Um, even without discussing the greater need from population growth and aging population that we've uh, shown in the visual today. Right. And so, uh, you know, I think we have to be very clear on what our goals are, and I think we need to make a long-term plan looking out 10 and 20 years about where we really want to be in terms of uh, the physician workforce. And that, that, that without, without that, uh, you know, I think that we'll be tweaking around, around the edges. So I would just say, um, you know, as we as we go through this, certainly primary care is not the only answer, but it's I think a big uh, part of the solution to access for our patients. Uh, we need to keep the patients at the center of the discussion, and you know we we always need to remember that. That's why we're doing this in the first place, and um, we need to have some very clear. Uh, long-term goals that are measurable that we can you know, march towards and we shouldn't do this in little um, you know in little uh, segments we, in little pieces we should try to really see um, see where we're going and and aim towards that so that would be my that would be my take I really appreciate it so in summary it sounds to me like primary care is going to be a large piece of the solution but it's only one piece as you say and we're gonna to have to be mindful of how we better take care of our communities how we engage them on issues of poverty how we engage people on issues of safety and that speaks to uh, shows which I'm sure we'll take up in the future how do we educate um, 
our community so that they have good jobs, so they don't end up in a vehicle, a car, living in a car with a severe health problem, which they might only be able to get a certain amount of care from their doctor. Uh, you and I will do our part to make sure we train plenty of physicians, but I think we'll have to rely on many of our friends and allies out there to help us with the well-being of all. So again, thank you for joining us in health, uh, our program Healthcare in Hawaii. My name is Josh Green and Doc from Big Island and Senator for Kona and Kau. And today I was joined by Dr. Chip Hickson, who's done a very good job helping to explain what family medicine and primary care is about and what our needs are going forward for our patients in our country. Thanks for being with us.